work in conditions with all this contamination present, but the lubricant properties are changing. Their performance is being impaired if we let this uh, material accumulate. Um, we want to dramatically extend oil lifetimes and reduce overall, overall impact. Fluid breakdown is often viewed as unavoidable, but this not need be the case. Oils degrade because of chemistry. So lubricant chemistry management puts a protective shield over your critical lubrication equipment and manages that are determining the amount that's happening. Okay. What you're going to find is that the level of breakdown is probably five to 10 times higher than it needs to be. Okay. So step one, we have two pillars to lubricant chemistry management. And the first one re relates to analysis. And I like to say, you can't manage what you're blind to. So assumptions hill. Okay. In this case, do not assume that everything is where it should be and that the right tests are being done, the right test methods are being used, and that the limits are correct. I've seen so many problems with all of these things. Um, when I travel, sometimes they won't let computers in the facility. So then you're just left in a presentation room like this with no computer. And it's like, you know, these are the best opportunities. What can we look at? Can you show me your lab analysis? So we go through the lab analysis and what we see is numbers that are left in outer space. They're just numbers on a page that aren't related to anything. No standards, no test methods, no limits, no condemning limits. So this one plan, I was talking to the plant manager and, and I'm looking at these numbers and I'm, I'm quite alarmed. I, mean, I say, sir, you are a thousand percent above condemning limit. He was absolutely shocked. Meanwhile, they only, they're generating 40% of the power in this country at that one facility. So how is this happening? It's like engineers, managers, um, leaders have literally hundreds, if not hundreds and hundreds of responsibilities. This is one area that can be quickly fixed for not a lot of money, right? Um, no interpretation. Did you know that your customers are expecting the lab analysis to be interpreted? But no, the lab is going, no, we don't do interpretation. We're just providing the data. You wanted it for $75 or $150. There's no way you can get interpretation for that. In fact, many cases, these numbers are being pulled out of a computer system automatically and put on a report and sent out with a set of human nines, never even seeing it. There is a big disconnect between the expectations the end users have and what the labs are providing. Fortunately, we have some excellent guidance and expertise at our fingertips. We have the, the GEK in term, like the OEM fluid maintenance standards. Uh, we have ASTM. If anybody hasn't, if anybody doesn't know about ASTM, ASTM is an international body, uh, over a hundred countries represented to come up with what the community feels is the, is the best testing, best test methods, best recommendations. And to get a standard through ASTM is, is quite an achievement because it's consensus based. So it's not majority rules. To get an ASTM standard, there's been thousands of hours put into these. Okay. They have to be renewed on a regular basis. So just comparing your lab results to the ASTM standards relevant for your application, relevant to your application is a game changer. And what you're going to find is that in, I would argue, 80% of the cases, whatever lab analysis is being done is not following the guidance of ASTM. And I don't know why that is. So routine isn't good enough. I mean, this was a $20 million failure in Mexico at Laguna Verde nuclear power plant, and the analysis looked great. But when you start looking at something like varnish, and this is before the varnish test existed, this failure occurred, okay? EPT has been around for 30 years and it wasn't called varnish 30 years ago. It was just called oil failure, a lubricant deposits, coking. There was a number of different words uh, discussed. So until you start looking at what's really in the fluid, you have big problems because there can be a gap between what the analysis is showing and then what is really in the fluid, okay? So MPC, there's an international standard ASTM D7843-21. 
The dash 2.1 stands for the year that the test was updated. Okay, again, these have to be updated on a regular basis. You don't need to know this formula. MPC is expressed as delta E, but there's three different color values in that test. And you can see these. What you want is a test that looks like this, because this means that there's nothing that can come out of your oil when the pressures or temperatures or flow rates change, okay? But because mechanical systems are dynamic and we can have extreme pressure to low pressure in a, in a millisecond, the material that's in this oil can transfer forms. So I would say there is really no safe MPC level per se. It, it would depend on the mechanical properties of the system. If you had constant flow temperature and pressure, Maybe you could say that there is a, an MPC value that would be safe, but when you dramatically change the conditions to which the lubricant is being exposed, this oxidation material that is accumulating in the oil is going to transfer forms. It's going to come out. The second part that's, that's problematic is the polarity of this material is more attracted to the mechanical surfaces than it is to the oil itself. So allowing this material to accumulate in the oil is problematic. So uh, a couple little tips here. Did you know that the MPC value will increase the longer the hold period is in the sample container? So I, I see samples on people's desks and they're sitting there for one day, two day, three day. If the lab gets it 10 days later, the result will be higher. So for this reason, the this test standard requires that the sample is reset back to operating temperature for 24 hours, and then rested for between 68 and 74 hours in a UV resistant environment. Well, this is a complicated test now, right? I know we can only do it twice a week at our office, unless we're gonna be sending people in on the weekend, right? Okay, so ASTM requires that the hold period in hours is presented and reported with the MPC Delta E value and you're going to see that if you look at your reports, it may or may not be there. Um, next slide. Just quickly speaking here, we want this. This is chemistry breakdown. And when you see the dark patches like this, I'm going to say that's a mechanical or engineering related issue. This is carbon. This is from burning the oil into its hydrocarbon subcomponents. Okay. That's carbon. Um, that carbon is below the range of filtration. It's under 0.1 micron pharmaceutical grade because I've used the 0.1 micron pharmaceutical grade filters and it doesn't remove it, okay? The only way to remove that material is electrostatics. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this, this is only telling us color. So we don't know concentration. So we like to weigh the patch, only takes an extra five seconds, and then we can measure the grams, the milligrams it is, and then we know, oh, is this a high concentration or a low concentration? That's one extra thing that the labs can do that's really beneficial. Okay, let's get into the maintenance. So why do we need maintenance? Well, this is an excellent brand new turbine oil. And when we break it down in the lab at 150 C over five, 600 hours, this is how it breaks down. So um, all lubricants will produce MPC as they break down. So it's not an oil problem. It's not a, it's not a quality issue to the oil. It's chemistry, okay? So I don't have the slide for it, but there's also a direct correlation to the additive values. So the additive values decrease exactly the same. So it is a mirror image, okay? So we would prefer if we use less additive, we prefer that our additive consumption rate is minimized and that over time, the additive consumption came down like this as opposed to like that. So we've tested every oil. They all do this. This is every single one. Um, there's so many users looking for varnish free oils. Well, it doesn't exist. It's not an oil problem. It's a thinking problem because oils are supposed to break down. Okay. So some tools we can use. Um, I was at the annual STLE conference. Uh, I think it was 14 years ago. 
and there was some oxidation and oxidation papers being presented. The PhDs were all talking about advanced oxidation breakdown and oxygen. And I put up my hand, I said, well, why don't we just remove the oxygen? Everybody thought that was a crazy comment. So that was the birth of uh, TMRN2. So TMRN2 is one of the world's smallest nitrogen generators, okay? It has no electrical parts. You just give it compressed air source and it splits the output into nitrogen and oxygen. You don't need a lot because it's minus 70 C dew point on a free flowing basis. It has unlimited capacity to remove water. It's gonna remove 50, 60 parts per million per day, something like that. So it's intended for uh, water ingression issues that are low to moderate. It is not intended for bulk water removal. So this is how it works. We just, ideally, this is how it works. We inject the nitrogen on the one side of the tank and we just vent it across and, and discharge it out the breather element. Um, there is not, um, we had one customer that decided that they were gonna use this to regenerate their breather elements. So they built a manifold about one meter long with about eight bulkhead fittings on it. And they would go around the plant and they'd take the breather elements, the desiccant breather elements and just screw it in to regenerate them. That's not its intended purpose. The best use of uh, any lubricant that you can put nitrogen on top is gonna do wonderful things. It's gonna uh, reduce the contact with oxygen in the reservoir. It's gonna remove the water. Um, typically the ingression source of water is atmosphere. Now there's other sources of course, but in the case where atmospheric ingress is the, <laughs> is the predominant pathway to water ingression, this is an excellent way to mitigate that. Um, there's, in cases where that is, uh, if you put a vacuum dehydrator on an oil system where the ingress pathway is atmosphere, you're just dehydrating the fluid so that it can remove more water from atmosphere. You're creating a very in, uh, energy intensive cycle. Vacuum dehydrators have their place. They're actually essential. They're great tools in the right application, in the right place, but not when the ingression source is atmosphere. So when we started uh, promoting the use of ion exchange resins and developing the use of ion exchange resins, um, it was for acid removal in the ester-based fluids that Ontario Power Generation uses in their control systems. Um, so we started with Fuller's Earth, they went to Illumina, Selexorb, other types of absorbents. And ion exchange at the time was considered a little bit um, radical. Um, but what has happened over the last 30 years is that the use of ion exchange resins have been adapted. They've been designed to um, remove a much broader range of contamination. Okay, so um, we can use them now for demulsibility correction, water separation correction. We can use them for improving the electrical properties of oil. We can use them for taking out the varnish or the precursors that would uh, otherwise form varnish. There's quite a wide variety of contamination that can be selectively removed with ion exchange resins. There you go. So the ion exchange resin is sacrificial surface area that's really easy to change. Electrically, the contamination in the oil is more attracted to the ion exchange resin than it is to the oil, okay? So as long as this is in the equation or in the circuit, that oxidation material can't form on a mechanical surface. It has to go here first, okay? So we have different chemistries of ion exchange resins. Uh, we categorize them by the names of the lubricant families they're used in, RNO for rust and oxidation, FRF for fire resistant fluids, JET for jet lubricants, and most recently, AW for hydraulic fluids, okay? Um, these have no additives, very few. Uh, RNO oils have about 1% additive, jet lubricants similar, and then when we get into AW, we're pushing three to 5% additive. So we're basically much more careful when we start dealing with additized lubricants on what we can take out, okay? Um, fortunately, the tuning and selectivity of ion exchange resins can be programmed to get around that in most cases. 
Um, on the heavier additized products, we do do testing before and after to make sure there's no impairment in the additive before uh, we position the product in service. So getting back to that breakdown test I was showing earlier, without the use of ICB ion exchange resins, the MPC level chemistry is unmanaged, the MPC level increases, the rate of additive consumption increases, but with the ICB, you actually get an improvement from new, and you get perfect oil quality thereafter. Uh, MPC levels of under one, additive consumption rates much lower. No acid. You know the condemning limit for lubricants right now is the combination of low additive, under 25%, in combination with high acid number. So we can still get this situation with low additive, but you're never going to have an acid number and you're never going to have a varnish potential. Okay? Um, the system itself is quite elegant and simple. That's one of its big best selling features. There's very little that can go wrong on this system. It's like there's 40 parts and the system has been engineered with four re independent redundant fail safes. When you're using ion exchange resins, the risk would ever be that you would get ion exchange resin outside of the filter and then outside of the system. So this is why we've taken painstaking efforts with the four independent fail safes. We had a nuclear power plant in Europe with that was uh, 10 times out of above condemning limit. Say so we can't, we're not interested. We, it's beyond the capabilities of what we can do. So you cannot use this. So then they went and got it through nefarious channels through resellers out of Houston, Texas. And lo and behold, they called us, said, we're having some weird issues with your machine. They said, wait a second, we told you not to use it. Um, thankfully, only the first fail safe was ever, I've only seen one case where the first level of fail safe was, was, was seen, okay? Uh, most recently, uh, last month, we introduced the world SVR Hydro. Now that has all the benefits of the thousand or so SVRs that are in service, but now we've added a coalescer in the middle. As you will recall, coalescing technology fell out of favor over the last 15 years because of water, oil water separation issues. But water is polar. Oxidation material is also polar. So the, the, the reason emulsions exist in the lubricant in the first place is usually the oxidation material. Not all the time, but the majority of the time. So by, by removing the oxidation material, you break the emulsion and you break the water oil separation issues. So the combination of these technologies together is amazing. Um, and to, regarding today's presentation, Andrew's going to talk to you shortly. Um, our company has a combination product that combines, uh, it's called ECR. It combines electrostatics, ion exchange resins, the nitrogen generators, high efficiency filtration, inline oil quality sensors, automation, SCADA controls, Internet of Things. And uh, on EHC systems, this manages quite a wide range of contamination. Okay. And EHC applications are complicated because of the high pressure uh, fluids and, and the stress that these fluids are put under. In, in cases of cavitation or micro dieseling, we're also getting carbon. We're getting a, a pretty broad range of contamination that has to be addressed, and we require different technologies to remove it. So just a couple of case studies, and Andrew, Andrew's presentation is actually a case study, but on the gas turbine lube oil side, I want to show you what is possible. Uh, here's a 10-year case study lubricant chemistry management. And in a lube oil application, lube oils are generally lasting eight years, six to eight years. Then they're replaced and flushed quite often. But this is after 10 years base load. MPC has never gone above 1.8, which is better than new. And after 10 years, the primary antioxidant is still at 91% remaining. So that's less than 1% a year consumption rate. Now, these people were adding 5% new fluid every year for top up. So you're seeing the benefit of both together. Typically, I'm gonna go out here a little bit and argue that when you put top up into a system that's full of oxidation material, you are losing that additive in very, very short duration. But when you use lubricant chemistry management, 
you've removed all that material. When you do add top up, there's nothing to react with that additive in the top up. So you're preserving it. Okay. It's a great one, two punch here. Um, this is a Wyoming power plant. We wanted to case study the ECR there first before it went to a nuclear power plant. Um, what you can see here is a pretty dramatic result. Uh, they didn't have any constraints with changing filters. This, um, our normal cleanup pattern is to change filters monthly for three months, and then you're moving on to either a quarterly or semi-annual PM. Um, we had fantastic results. Mechanically, this was interesting. When they tested this uh, ETD testing, it has to be done weekly. And the ETD testing um, is measuring the response rates and the effectiveness of, the, of the, the system. And when it doesn't work, they would actually use the hammer and they would hammer it. I said, you don't happen to have a picture of you hammering the valves. And he said, yes. So he sends me the picture and I said, well, can you send me one without your face in it? <laughs> Um, and they actually have a standard operating procedure on how to strike the ETD when it fails. Like, wait a second here. So exciting is that, the next slide, we re, the, the valve, in 96 tests, they had about a 13% failure rate before, and after we put the, the system on, it went down to 6.3%. So pretty remarkable. Now we don't see these results in the nuclear application because nuclear starting point is always really high, high quality, high sophistication. In the fossil burning plants, sometimes that sophistication is there. So you can see incredible improvements in mechanical performance. Um, this is one from Duke Energy. They're gonna be, pre be presenting this results at EPRI in January, but again, it's a very successful result. So in summary, my last slide, and I'm four minutes over, um, this doesn't have to be complicated. There's so much that can be done. Start with the testing. You're already spending the money on the testing, right? Make sure the testing is done the way it's supposed to be done to international standards and fill in the gaps. You just have to compare the two and go, oh, okay, I can change this. I can do this. I don't need to do this monthly. I can switch that to quarterly. There might even be cost savings opportunities but getting those correct baselines, those correct targets, the correct tests. And if you're doing varnish testing, make sure that is being reset the way that the test says, okay? And then once your testing is in place on the fluid conditioning side, add technology, add technology to manage the variables within the chemistry that are causing the oil to fail. It doesn't have to fail so quickly, right? It can be probably less than, one tenth as much of breakdown is possible in a best case scenario. So there we go. So thank you. Okay, so now we start with Andrew's uh, presentation. Uh, Andrew's presentation is in PDF format, so we have to do it this way. Okay, so I brought them here. <laughs> okay, uh, good, in good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Sitt. I'm with Ontario Power Generation. My presentation tonight, is basically a case study of the application of Peter Peter's uh, uh, EPT clean oil technology on um, the uh, uh, turbine control systems uh, at uh, Pickering uh, Nuclear Generating Station on on the four units um, on the uh, Pickering B side. Next slide, please. Okay, so yes. So uh, can you, can everybody hear me okay? I can't hear anybody through here. We can hear you fine, no, Andrew. Okay, okay, excellent. Okay, so um, just an introduction. Um, 
I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, steam turbine electrohydraulic control systems, but uh, I'll just give a quick introduction uh, of it to you. Um, so here, um, so most uh, most nuclear stations and modern uh, nuclear thermal power plants use uh, phosphate ester-based uh, fire-resistant fluids as their hydraulic fluid, uh, simply because uh, it's fire-resistant. If, if there's a leak of it, it sprays on high, hot uh, steam piping. Uh, it's fire-resistant. There's no fire. Um, and uh, phosphate ester fire-resistant fluids came about uh, uh, predominantly back in around the 1970s and beyond. Prior to that, uh, we were using turbine oils as the uh, uh, hydraulic fluid, and that's and you can see that on the older Pickering units, units one and four, are still using the um, turbine oil as the as the EHC hydraulic fluids. Um, up in the top uh, right corner, you can see the molecule of the phosphate ester fluid we're using. It's basically a uh, phosphoric acid uh, uh, backbone with uh, uh, um, aryl, uh, aryl, aryl phenol uh, constituents uh, built around around the uh, um, the the phosphoric acid. So it's 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 an est it it's it's formula it's created um, through an esterification process uh, uh, with uh, the phosphoric acid and the uh, aryl phenol uh, alcohols. Um, phosphate ester FRFs are exceptionally Good for their purpose because of the fire resistance and their their excellent uh, lubricating properties. And phosphate esters can be very lo low maintenance and long and have long service life. But uh, many operators, such as uh, Ontario Power Generation, are uh, quite challenged with uh, rapid degradation degradation problems with uh, the phosphate ester fluids. Um, okay, next slide, please. <laughs> Sorry, by the way. Okay, no. one more, please. One more slide. Okay, there. Okay, so um, FRF FRF undergoes degradation in service due to a number of factors. Um, the uh, one one of the main ones is the high shear stress uh, due to constant volume pumps. Um, the EHC hydraulic system, uh, when when the when the turbine is at steady state, there's very little to system demand for the fluid. But the constant volume pumps are constant, putting full output, and most of the fluid is recirculated back to tank. And there's a very large recirculation of, of the fluid being pumped up to very high pressures, and then uh, uh, returned through a, a pressure relief valve back into the tank. And that puts very high shear stresses on on the fluid. Um, the second one is micro dieseling, in which air bubbles get into the fluid and get uh, pulled into the high pressure pump and uh, basically uh, generate very high temperatures and possibly uh, combustion of of uh, the fluid with uh, around the air bubble. Third one is hydrolysis, uh, which is basically a deesterification. Um, Reaction uh, due to high water content, and that's basically the reverse of how the molecules formulated in the first place. So, the um, contaminants that we see in uh, FRFs are self generated acids, phenols, uh, varnish, and carbon, and we see external uh, contaminants coming from uh, metals, which are basically wear particles, and from aminic ions, uh, uh, from purification media. Uh, such as uh, um, ion exchange resins. Um, now, a key factor to uh, to FRF stability on long life is design is the design of the FRF system. Uh, Westinghouse and General Electric steam turbines use uh, swash plate axial piston pumps, which vary the high pressure pump output uh, according to system demand, and generally those units, those turbines. Do not experience uh, chronic uh, um, chronic uh, FRF uh, degradation problems. Par Parsons and ABB use the screw pumps, which are uh, constant volume, and they're they're constantly putting out full output, uh, and uh, and and exhibit the high uh, the high shear stress on the fluid, which degrades it very quickly. And unfortunately, those are the two turbines that 
um, OPG chose. We use the Parsons at Pickering and the ABB turbines at Darlington. And we see, we see the difference uh, quite dramatically at the Bruce units in which the Bruce A uses the Parson turbines and they're having all sorts of FRF problems. Uh, Bruce B units use the GE turbines and they have very, actually very little problem with uh, FRF, even though they are using the same fluid. Okay, next slide, please. Um, hmm. Let's go back one. <laughs> okay, just uh, just as this, um, I just want to give you a description of what the uh, EHC system looks like. Uh, so we have the FRF supply, sometimes called the power package, and it's, it con consists of re a reservoir, which is basically a tank, anywhere from four thousand to eight thousand liters, uh, or even larger on on larger turbines. There's pumps um, that, that take high pressure pumps that take the that uh, output. Uh, Anywhere between uh, uh, 600 and 1,000 psi uh, pressure. There's mechanical filtration purification systems uh, such as uh, Fuller's Earth, Illumina, IX, IX Exchange resins um, uh, that uh, pull out uh, acid co uh, contaminants. There's heaters, coolers, uh, breathers, vapor extra extraction fans, pressure regulators, and instrumentation. Okay. So, um, what the FRF does in the hydro in the electrohydraulic control system is they operate a number of valves uh, uh, presented on the slide. The governor valves are the um, they are the main steam valves that uh, uh, let the, the st uh, steam enter the turbine to to spin their steam turbines. We have overspeed trip valves, um, which are valves that uh, uh, trip when when turbine overspeeds due to loss of load. Uh, uh, or governor failure, load rejection, etc. We have uh, emergency stop valves which uh, shut the turbine down very quickly, and we have intercept valves which cut off steam going to the low pressure uh, steam turbines. Now, all of these valves are actuated by uh, hydraulic cylinders from the FRF, and the and the uh, uh, FRF going into these hydraulic cylinders are controlled by servo valves, very, which are very very small. Um, very sensitive uh, uh, electro electromechanical valves, which take a very small signal and uh, can can control something like the governor valves. Each governor valve can control hundreds of megawatts. So, next slide. Here's a picture of a servo valve. The actual servo valves really not much larger than than the fist a uh, 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 fist, right? But um, they they take a very small electrical signal. They're very, they're actually quite complicated, so I'm not going to explain how, how they work. They, they take a very small electrical signal, and they can control, like I said earlier, hundreds of megawatts in the in the main steam uh, in the main steam valves. Uh, at the heart of the servo valve is the spool, which um, has a very tight cl uh, clearances of one to four microns. So it's so these valves are very sensitive to fluid contamination. Um, problems with the servo valves are stiction and jamming, and uh, Peter showed the examples earlier where uh, uh, one one plant had to hammer their valve in order to get the spool moving because they they were they were sticking. Um, the the uh, the servo valve spools can get coated with varnish, as you see on the bottom right um, from from varnish. Which form, which form from uh, the, the high high acid reacting with the uh, purification media, or um, uh, or from ultra fine particles, either weir particles or from uh, these uh, very fine carbon particles that are sometimes generated in in the uh, FRF system. And these and this results in stiction or the valve jamming, basically not responding to to uh, the electrical signal. Next, please. Okay, so monitoring. Uh, Peter had talked about the uh, MPC earlier, and this is just a um, very uh, quick explanation of how that that is done. We take, um, we basically take a fluid sample. I think I believe it's fifty milliliters. We pass it through uh, a 0.45 micron screen, and we capture salt body. 
filter membrane. And uh, this is on top of, um, uh, what's it called, the settling time. There, there's stuff like 40, was it 42, 48 or 72 hours settling, settling time where the, the sample is just left to, uh, to um, rest before, before being uh, uh, tested in, in this uh, apparatus. The, the sample, the, the fil filter membrane is tested with the, this device on the lower, lower right, which is colorimeter and returns the uh, delta E value, which is in the I, I, C, E, C, I, E, L, E, B uh, color space. And uh, this uh, delta E is known as the MPC value. Next, please. Um, so uh, here are some examples from uh, Pickering. Uh, taken back in 2001, um, MPC uh, ranged anywhere from 49 to 78, which is quite bad. Uh, uh, normally, we want to see below 30, 30. From about 10 to 30 is like a warning range, and below 10, you're, it's very good. Um, we also have the A plus B value, which is from the uh, I, I, C, CIE lab equation that. Uh, Peter has shown in his slide, and, and the, the A plus B value is an, indi is an indicator of the red, um, the red yellow content of, of the uh, patch color, which indicates the higher it is, it, indica it, it indicates the, the, <coughs> the higher uh, varnish content of what the material captured on the patch. The lower the value means it's more of a, like a, a, a gray blue color, and that's more indicative of uh, carbon carbon material. And um, the last, on the last row is the contaminant loading, which is the same as the uh, MPC patch weight, which Peter had mentioned earlier. And that's, that's, that is indicating the um, contaminant loading of the fluid. So we consider the MPC patch weight probably more important than the MPC value itself. Uh, the lower the value you get, the less, the lower the um, uh, contaminant loading of the fluid. So. And as you can see, the, the values I'm showing here, they are uh, they're actually in grams. We were, we're normally measuring this stuff in milligram. And so the, the contaminant loading in, on these uh, slides are, are on these patches are very high. Next, please. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, we, 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 at Pickering, we started a project to apply um, the EPT technology to the, uh, Pickering units. We we're applying um, uh, the TMR N2 ga uh, nitrogen gas, dry nitrogen gas purge on top of the headspace of the tank uh, to remove water. We're using electrostatic uh, filtration to remove the insoluble varnish and any, any particulate. And we're using um, uh, IX resin to pull out uh, varnish acid, phenols, and, and that sort of thing. So um, the, the parameters of interest to us in this project were the following water content, which, um, which is telling us how well the TMR, uh, TMR N2 dry gas purge is working, uh, acid number, um, which is a control parameter and, and very indicative of uh, FRF contamination um, in our systems. Resistivity, which is basically the, the inverse of conductivity, we want to keep resistivity very high because there was a historical, historical problem with uh, low resistivity leading to electrokinetic um, erosion of um, servo valve spools. MPC patch, or MPC, membrane patch color, we talked about the patch weight we talked about. The ruler phenol, ruler is uh, basically linear sub-voltammetry method in which we measure the phenol aerophenol content of, of, of the fluid, um, which, which are created in the deesterification uh, reaction of, of, of the um, uh, phosphate ester molecule. So phenols are, uh, the phenols in themselves are uh, not detrimental to the system, but uh, they're an indicator that uh, we do have um, uh, degradation occurring and then the last, the last one is high pressure delta, delta P. Uh, this is not a chemistry parameter, but we're watching that very carefully because uh, um, we're not the first ones to use the EPT technology combined into one package. This was first used at Bruce 
a and they had serious problems with um, their high pressure filters plugging very rapidly. They went from uh, stuff like 13, 13 week filter changes down to 13 days. So they, they saw like a seven time reduction in uh, filter life. So this is this is the skid. It's made by Hypro. It 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 takes the EPT, EPT technology and combines it all all, all onto one skid. Um, and the reason why we're we want it combined is because we have tried each of these technologies separately in the past, and we we failed. We failed at purifying uh, Efrof with it. Um, we we tried we tried I, IX resin by itself. It, it was never too successful at it. We we were uh, we had some luck controlling uh, acid, but we saw resistivity just drop off a cliff when we started applying it. Um, we tried electrostatic, but we didn't control the water, so electrostatic was kind of useless because uh, uh, the 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 charge plates in the electrostatic static separator were not able to maintain the high voltage. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay, so we, we bought we bought this we bought four of these kits uh, um, with the intent of uh, of attaching them one onto each of the Pickering B units. And this started back in uh, Q3 2003. Next please. Okay, so Peter showed you this already. This is dry nitrogen gas being generated and blown across the reservoir and exhausted. And this technology is incredibly effective. Like we turn it on, water, we see water drop very rapidly, and we very often have to Mike <laughs> Mike has to call operation tweak it back. We're we're getting too dry, <laughs> and very often we have to turn it off. So very very actually quite surprised at how effective this is at, at uh, drying our fluid. So we're uh, 600, 600, 700 ppm moisture. Very easy to bring that moisture down to between two to two to three hundred ppm water. Next. Okay, so um, electrostatic separation. Uh, basically, it's uh, uh, we maintain a high voltage between two charge plates with the absor absorbing those are pulled. Charge particles are pulled one one way or the other. Towards the plate and get caught up in get caught in the uh, absorption media. Um, the picture down below on the right that's not from Pickering. That's from another station. That's that was very that looks very bad. We've examined our um, elements after several months of operation and they looked fairly clean. Uh, there were some some deposits. I've, I've taken those deposits and looked at under a microscope and. Uh, Found all the deposits were varnish, and there was uh, no no evidence whatsoever of carbon. Okay, so the importance of this is you want to remove the the, the fine and the soft body body particles before you start using the resin because this material will um, bind your resin and and basically uh, you get very short short uh, surface life out of your resin. And the third technology is. Um, IX resin, uh, basically originally used for acid removal, but uh, uh, EPT is, uh, 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 has um, combined a, a mixed bed resin in which, which uh, in, with, with the goals of increasing resistivity, removing uh, soluble varnish, uh, phenols, et cetera. So um, at Pickering, we started using a one brand of IX resin back in 2013, and we we saw resistivity fall off, and then very shortly after, very rapid darkening of the fluid, and then uh, with with the new high pro skids, we've we've stopped using that resin. Next, please. Okay, so this is the first um, unit that was commissioned, and you can see how uh, how dramatic the the, the results were. Um, we we got the water water content under control uh, by August, and by from August to December, we ran the electrostatic separation. And that basically brought MP, MPC down from uh, above 60 down to about 30. Okay, and uh, and we also 
and also we saw uh, resistivity increased quite dramatically. Uh, in December, we ran the, the IX resin for about a month, and we we went from um, sorry, sorry, the electrostatic brought it down to about 50. Then with the IX resin, we brought we brought the fluid down, we brought the MPC down from close to 50 down to below 10. So we got we came back to almost a new fluid. Okay, next please. Uh, this is commissioning work this year. We didn't see quite as dramatic results as we did on Unit 7 last year. So we're still trying to understand why. It's probably because we are, we're not changing our resins frequently enough. Uh, but we did get from, we did go from uh, fairly high MPCs above 60 down to 30. That's basically just using the electrostatic separation. And then when we turned on the resin, we didn't see improvement in the MPCs, but we saw patch rate come down. We saw acid number improve. We saw, uh, um, yeah, we saw those parameters improve and, and phenols improve as well. Okay, next. Okay, so um, water content, as you can see uh, on all of our units, we're, we're trying to maintain water content between 200 and 500 ppm but ideally we're trying to get between 200 and 300. So on three of the four units, we, we, we were successful at doing that. Uh, one of the, on one, on unit five, we, we were not, we actually have not been running the skid on it. So that, so unit five is serves like a control um, versus the other three units where we are running the skid. Okay, next. So acid number, same thing we see, we're trying to uh, bring the acid below point, uh, Zero one, sorry, point point one zero, and um, on three units towards the uh, very right of the graph, you can see that uh, we've basically achieved that. Um, on unit five, our control unit, the, uh, we're still using the old um, the old IX resin uh, from before, and we, we're barely able to maintain point uh, point one five. Next. So resistivity, um, like I said, when we first started using the uh, the other brand of resin back in 2013, we saw resistivity drop below one, basically, which uh, um, is not good. Um, but in this case, we see uh, resistivity increase, especially when we turn the electrostatic separation on which which is which are the gray triangles the ECR when we turn those on we see a very dramatic increase in um, resistivity and for some reason not not so much when we turn the resin on which is the SVR and then if you look at unit 5 the, the resin basically does nothing it keep the resistivity stays fairly low okay uh, MPC color um, again for all all uh, three units, six, seven, eight, we see trend, we see the MPC trending down, um, except for unit seven, which was, we we had run that to December 20, 20, 2003, then the unit went into outage, and then we didn't restart it again until probably around July. So once we restarted that, we were starting to see that trend come down. Okay, next. And the patch weight, um, yeah, you, you can see all th the, the three units um, doing very well, everything trending down or down to where we want to be somewhere uh, around one or below. Um, and then uh, you see unit five is actually going in the opposite direction. Okay. And the uh, ruler phenol, uh, we, we are trying to get below 2400. Um, we see two of the units uh, achieve that, and then the gray line unit seven is is coming down, uh, and we expect to achieve achieve that uh, shortly. Okay. And the filtered delta p. Okay, so um, on the orange line, the unit six uh, where we have that spike, that just ignore that because that was a pump train change. Um, but uh, before after we uh, turn the electrostatic and the IX resin on, we see the rate of uh, delta P increase unchanged. 
Um, so we, we did not see the same problem that, that Bruce A saw. And uh, we, we, we think that we think the cause of that is because Bruce A, th their units were a lot dirtier than the Pickering units. Um, Pickering units before we started applying the, the EPT technology, we did a number of full reservoir uh, fluid changes. So that probably cleaned out the systems pretty well. Um, uh, when, when, when applying technology to remove varnish, the, uh, uh, the conventional theory is that uh, you, you, you'll see, you see varnish increase until you see it decrease because it's pulling out the, the deposited. As you, as you remove varnish from the, from the fluid, the, the varnish that's plated out in the systems get, gets uh, um, uh, soluble, solubilized back into the fluid and you see that increase until the system is clean. Then you see the varnish come down and, and stay down. So I think, I think that's what they're seeing at, at uh, Bruce A. They, they're in that phase where, they're in, where their varnish are actually increasing and they didn't push on beyond that. They just stopped at, at that point. Okay, next, please. Okay, so um, uh, okay, so overall, applying, applying the, the three technologies from EPT, we saw uh, very good, we are seeing good control of the parameters of interest. Um, we, we are not seeing nearly as dramatic uh, an improvement to this year as we did with Unit 7 last year. We did not see the delta, the, the high pressure filter depletion rate that Bruce A saw. Um, challenges, uh, commissioning these units was very, it's very resource intensive. We, we, had, we, have, um, uh, we have projects, uh, chemistry, system engineering, uh, operations, maintenance, all in a very tight team working, working on this commission. And, and we're very fortunate to have, to have had very good teamwork and uh, very responsive, a very good response from the various uh, members to, to, to do things that, that, uh, that were required. Um, we, we have seen excessive downtime of the skids when we're changing out uh, either the, um, Electrostatic elements or the uh, the resin canisters, because we 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 basically shut the, the shut the skids down, safe state them, just de-energize them completely before we, we perform any work on them. Um, and even though okay, so the the uh, the third the third point in the challenges is uh, we we are challenged to keep water content steady because it it's. Even though I said I said that the technology works very well, um, there's a there's constant feedback coming to chemistry. Chemistry looks at the number, and then we have to call we call into operations. They go tweak they go tweak the gas flow, and then the cycle repeats. And we're probably tweaking these things up and down a couple of times a month. So, I that's something that I believe can be easily automated. Um, and recommendation to the vendor the 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 pump. Not not to APT, but to um, Hypro, the 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 equipment manufacturer, uh, put in the duplex uh, SVR or resin filter, so we can uh, valve one out, change the canister while the the skid is still in service, and then, like I said, autom automate the water content, the wa automate automate the dry gas flow for um, uh, for for water content control. Okay, and that's all I have. So, <laughs> how are we going to do this? Okay. I'll just read the first question. Um, well, you can see it on the screen. Um, some of the main reasons preventable, preventable failures are being allowed is uh, it starts with the, the lab analysis, um, not knowing what the standards are. Um, um, okay, sorry, I'll read the question for the table. 
Peter, what are the main reasons why preventable failures are being allowed? Not costs, so awareness, risk averse, change averse, don't give a... <laughs> yeah, all of the above. Um, this is This doesn't have to be so hard, right? This just starts with psychology. Why should I care? And why is it worth my time and effort, right? That's the biggest, that's the biggest reason. Status quo is long gone. It's, it's been buried. It's dead. The future is the future. And there's so much progress and improvement that can be made. We just have to decide to do it, right? I don't know why, but in our industry, uh, we are stuck 50 years behind in terms of technology. Uh, I used to have a, a, a picture in my presentation of a payphone. When was the last time you saw a payphone? Well, you know what? Payphone is modern compared to the technology that's being used to filter the lubricants in the most critical mechanical systems on earth, right? Second question to everyone. Andrew might want to mention that OPG issues with phosphate ester EHC were mainly the consequence of poor system design by the turbine OEM. It was con complicated by a reluctance to make significant upgrades. Do you have any comments on that, Andrew? Uh, yes, so for that question, I did mention that um, the ABB and Parsons turbines, they both use the uh, constant uh, volume screw pumps, right, which are, we, in, our, in, in my opinion, is the major cause of the rapid FRF degradation. With the ABB tank system as well, turbine as well, the, the tank is very uh, deep and uh, has a small, um, small, Surface area, so there's there's very small the 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 tank retention time is low to allow the bubbles to escape. So ABB has the two things going against them. Um, as far as changing the system, uh, this well this was tried at on Bruce Unit Four, which are also Parsons turbines. They basically took the entire FRF power package out, replaced it with a brand new General Electric power pack with um, swash plate axial pumps, and and they chopped out a lot of their dirty pipe and replaced their pipe. And um, for the year or two that they were operating, they 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 saw very good success with it. Uh, we tried a similar thing at Darlington on Unit Four, sorry on Unit Two, where we where we replaced the the, sir, the screw pumps. With uh, ax axial um, swash plate axial piston pumps, but uh, that project, the design of it was not sufficient, and uh, they're basically running the swash plate axial pumps as constant volume pumps, and they're not they're not improving their FRF condition because of that. So there are things being tried. Um, yeah, it just takes time, and money, and effort. I Just to add to Andrew's point there, um, when the stress in the fluid is five times greater, um, you're going to need five times more maintenance. But what I see in industry is that people are applying maintenance evenly, regardless of the fluid stress level, right? Um, these fluids are excellent fluids. They start off with an air release, minute, air release of under two minutes. But as they become degraded, they go to 10 minutes. So now, if we're at like 2,000 liters a minute on your screw pump. Do we have a 20,000 liter tank? No, we don't. Well, that's a self-buggering mechanism because we are stressing the heck out of this fluid. So the only thing you can actually do in the absence of system design, which is your hands are tied, is five times more fluid maintenance. Uh, ASTM D8323 is the standard for EHC fluids. It's an in-service guide for the maintenance and testing of phosphate ester fluids. Um, it's a great standard. Anybody that's testing or using these fluids should have that copy of that. It's $68. Um, Andrew, I'll read the question out. What is being used as the HB filter elements? And if the Hilliard system now out of service, it had the dry EIX. I'll let you answer that. The HP filter elements, I don't recall exactly what the declination de 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 were, but uh, we're using the PAL uh, Superlon filters. Um, I believe my five micron uh, rating, and that's that's those are the same filters that were being used that uh, um, on the Bruce A uh, systems. 
if the Hilliard system now, now out of service. Is the Hilliard system now out of service? Uh, that the, yeah, the intent was to uh, no longer use the Hilliard dry IX resin along with the, um, the uh, EPT ICB resins. But in practice, I don't, in many cases, we didn't, we did involve them out and we're using them in parallel. In my opinion, the, the, Hill, the Hilliard dry X are probably long depleted and basically don't do anything. They're just sitting there, <laughs> taking up a space that basically. Okay, thanks. Questions from our audience? Oh, okay. Okay, thank you for your very good presentation. Thank you very much. I have a question. Uh, as I understand, you decided the, uh, changing the filter and monitoring the oil by the MPT, monitoring the MPT result. But what do you do when uh, we have some uh, warning from the threats that? Uh, if we have varnish, uh, but uh, we don't have any uh, different uh, result in MPC, what should we do? Yeah, you know, uh, sometimes uh, we have varnish, but because of the uh, stress, because of the something, what can I do? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I can answer the question. I'm going to try. Um, so, what is the safe MPC value, right? Um, I say in a gas turbine, it's around 30 maximum. But in a steam turbine, we see failures at 15. But the standard is the same. And then when. Yeah. So the question, because you can't hear online, was in cases where there's shear stress and other more advanced breakdown mechanisms at play, uh, we see varnish, but it's not reflected on the MPC test. Um, this is interesting, and I see this in process gas applications too, like ammonia compressors, for example. They can have an MPC of seven, so kind of a white patch. But any breakdown material in that lubricant seems to be highly reactive with the processed gas so that the lubricant has got more resistance to the stress than the breakdown material. So what I normally recommend is just keep the MPC as low as possible. I think trying to get it to a 15 or less is not the right goal when there's uh, secondary or more complicated factors going on in the system. Um, for MPC removal, we want to see in mineral oils, a uh, one-time exchange per day in the tank. In synthetic oils or in, in areas where there's some more severe stress, we try to increase that to three times per day cycle time. Okay? Can we trust with, uh, for example, vibration, vibration, vibration? The question is, can we trust vibration analysis? I'm not a vibration expert. There's other people here that could talk to, to could speak to that. Uh, how, how many of uh, how many of uh, oil do you recommend to use the, this kind of filter? For example, if we have a, a small power pack, can we use this kind of filter for removing var varnish? Is it uh, reasonable? Yeah, it can be cost effective. Becomes a challenge on very small volumes. For example, if you only have like fifty or two hundred liters. Might be more cost effective to change it, but it would have for the same benefits if you could. We do have small systems that could be put on there. Depends on the stress, depends on the criticality of the application. It, it, it's sort of in your assessment, you have to look at a broader range of factors. Okay, but yes, we can clean it definitely. Okay, uh, my question is Have you seen the MPC patch coming back green? Yes. What does it mean? Um, there's probably other experts in this room, but when we see green patches, that's often a sign that there's copper in the system and the breakdown products in the system are interfacing or interacting with that copper in the system to make the patches green or blue. Okay. 
So keep the asset number as low as possible. Quick question for you, Andrew. Um, you mentioned that you wanted to bring the phenol levels down to, I believe you said 2,400 or so. Just curious why you chose that value because um, fun fact, we tested some fresh 46 XC and it, the phenol values were about 3,000. Um, so I'm just curious what, yeah. <laughs> so just curious why. <laughs> okay, I'll just answer the question. Uh, ASTM 8323 actually doesn't have a number, it just says as low as possible. So, for every molecule of acid you generate, you also generate one molecule of phenol. Because historically we've removed the acids and not the phenol, you can kind of look at the phenol as a historical marker of how much total acid has been generated in the lifetime of that fluid. So, um, with more modern ion exchange resin technology, you can remove both now. Technically, the phenol is a is an alcohol. It's a varnished precursor, but if you leave it in the lubricant, it will eventually come out, but not as quickly as say other things. Okay. Anything to add? That's it. Great. Good questions. Tuesday night after Thanksgiving, <laughs> you guys get a gold star for enthusiasm and interest level. Thank you very much for your attention and your patience. Um, it's an active group you have here in Toronto. So, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, for our online attendees that are joining us at 2 and 3 in the morning, um, get some sleep, please. <laughs> thank you so much. We're, um, we're very grateful for your attendance. There looks like a very large group of you. We will circulate out a recording at a later date. And um, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.